In this video, we will introduce the Kohonen self-organizing map. The Kohonen self-organizing map is useful for clustering, dimension reduction, and visualization. These are competitive learning algorithms that are fundamentally different from most of the various types of neural networks that we have discussed so far. The Kohonen self-organizing map belongs to the class of algorithms known as competitive learning. Now, competitive learning algorithms are a broader class than the Kohonen self-organizing map. And they are used and different variants are used for a variety of different applications. In particular, these algorithms, they are used for clustering, compression, dimensional reduction and visualization. The Kohonen self-organizing map is a special case that is designed for visualization. It also creates clusters and it also creates a dimensional reduction. However, its most useful application is its ability to provide two-dimensional visualization. In this video, we will first start by discussing the basic competitive learning algorithm for clustering and then we will discuss its enhancement to the Kohonen self-organizing map. In competitive learning, the neurons, they compete for the right to respond to a subset of the input data. The activation of an output neuron increases with greater similarity between the weight vector of the neuron and the input. So in this case, each neuron is associated with a weight vector that has the same dimensionality as the input data set. And a common approach in competitive learning is to use the Euclidean distance between the input and the weight vector in order to compute the activation. However, in principle, you could use any kind of distance or similarity function in order to compute the activation. The output unit that has the highest activation that or the smallest distance to a given input is declared as a winner and it is moved closer to the input. So let us set up the notations for uh, uh, for discussing competitive learning. So here, here we assume that x bar is an input vector in d dimensions and wi is the weight vector associated with the ith neuron in the same number of dimensions. So the weight vector of neurons and the inputs, all the input points of which x bar is one example, have the same dimension to d. Now the number of neurons M is typically much less than the size of the data set N. You can consider the number of neurons M as intuitively similar to the number of clusters. In fact, you can consider the weight vectors to be like the prototypes of the clusters. So in the previous slide, we had discussed that you are moving the weight vectors. Whenever a weight vector is very similar to an input point, you are moving that weight vector closer to the input point. Now moving a weight vector uh, closer to the input point is similar to how prototypes are always moved closer to the relevant clusters in algorithms like k-means. So <clears throat> let's look at the uh, iterative steps for each input point. So here uh, in competitive learning, we cycle through the data set and we sample points one by one. And for each input point x bar, we perform the following co computations. First, the Euclidean distance, that is wi minus x, or it could be any other type of similarity function, is computed for each i. And note that the activation uh, value is higher for greater similarity or smaller distance. So if the pth neuron has the smallest value of the Euclidean distance to the data point, then it is declared the winner. So uh, if, if the, dis the distance between wi and x, you compute this for all i and you find the neuron that's closest to the input point x, you declare that neuron uh, as the winner. So this pth neuron is then updated using the following uh, learning rule. So here you have WP is equal to WP plus alpha X minus WP. Note that with this kind of update, you are essentially moving WP closer to the input point X. And typically the learning rate alpha is much less than one. So typically you will be moving it by a small amount. Now note that this learning rate often it decreases over the course of the algorithm because this is an iterative algorithm in which you sample one point after the next and then you perform this update. So initially you start with larger learning rates and you gradually reduce them over time. 
This is not very different from how many other neural networks, uh, the, the way in which the learning rate is treated in many other types of neural network learning. Now, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the, this is very useful. It is very useful to compare this type of update, this type of process with the prototype based clustering algorithms like k-means. What we are essentially doing here is that each neuron WP can be treated like the prototype of a cluster. So we are, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to move the WPs uh, to different regions of the space in which the clusters exist. And conceptually, one can consider each point X to be assigned to its winner neuron at the termination of the process. So at the termination of the process, you actually get a clustering of the data points. So uh, in this case, the value of alpha, it regulates the fraction of the distance between the point and the weight vector by which the movement uh, of WP occurs. Now note that in k-means also you achieve similar goals. So you can consider each WP like a prototype, like a, like a centroid in a k-means clustering algorithm. And whenever you assign uh, a point to a winning centroid in the next iteration, because you are going to average over your new set of points, this point is going to influence your cluster. So typically the centroid will be moved uh, uh, by a small distance towards the towards the training point, especially if uh, th th that, uh, th that point is assigned to a particular winning centroid. And competitive learning is essentially a natural variation of this framework in which we are not performing the updates by this type of uh, centroid based construction, but rather we are using equation five, uh, which is more like um, a, a traditional uh, gradient descent type of update. Now, uh, th 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 this type of uh, learning, of course, it gives you uh, a clustering of the data set. And the reason it gives you a clustering of the data set uh, is because uh, now you have a set of neurons and at termination, you, uh, for each data point, you can find its winning neuron and, and you can create the clusters from your data set. So this is exactly like prototype clustering where your, where your neurons are like prototypes and you're learning the weights of this with these neurons with competitive learning. Now, uh, if you look at pure competitive learning, uh, it does not impose any relationships among the clusters. Uh, very often what happens is that uh, clusters have related content. So for example, let's say you have a document data set, then you might have uh, three or four different topics, uh, for example, such as art, drama, history, and so on. But typically what will happen is that all clusters belonging to a particular, all data, uh, all documents belonging to a particular topic may not be assigned to just one cluster. What will typically happen is that documents belonging to the same topic may often be assigned to closely related clusters. So one question that arises is that whether we can uh, place these clusters, these clusters that you're learning you, uh, using competitive learning, whether you can place them in two dimensions so that physically adjacent uh, clusters have related points. So for example, ideally you would want the arts related clusters to be all close together in two dimensions, all the history related clusters to be close together in two dimensions and so on. So here it is very important uh, to keep the physical placement, the fact that you are going to physically place the clusters in these two dimensions in mind during the cluster construction itself. It is very hard to place the clusters uh, physically close to one another if you don't uh, create the cluster specifically with this goal in mind. So covalent self-organizing map uh, achieves these goals and what it does is that it gives the same shape to each cluster. So for example, it, it might give a rectangular shape to each cluster and, or, or a hexagonal shape to each cluster. That's a conceptual uh, representation of the cluster and then it places them in, in either a two-dimensional hexagon or grid-like st structure depending on whether you have a rectangle or, uh, whether you have a rectangle or a hexagon. Uh, you, you can it, it will place them in different types of arrangements. So here I have given an example of how you know, Conan self-organizing map places the cluster. So for example, imagine we have documents belonging to four classes, literature, arts, drama, music. Uh, so depend, uh, all clusters here in both of these diagrams, they are represented either as rectangles or they are represented as hexagons. 
and as you can see clusters of a particular topic they are placed close together and uh, in in the left each rectangle is essentially one cluster so just, this is just a conceptual representation of the cluster uh, and all points uh, belonging to uh, that cluster belong to that rectangle. Now, it is also possible in certain types of Cohonan self-organizing map to decide where in the grid does a particular point lie. But in general, that is not necessary. Some Cohonan self-organizing ma map, they just assign all points to a particular grid and it's not decided where in the grid will a, will a particular point belonging to that cluster lie. But certain types of maps, they also allow you that finer granularity where you can interpolate the points within that grid. So you will get a one-to-one -one mapping where all points uh, have their own unique coordinate in two dimensions. So let's see how we can uh, uh, arrange the clusters in this way, how we can modify a basic competitive learning in order to encourage this, this type of two-dimensional arrangement of the clusters. So uh, the Cohonan self-organizing map is a variation on the competitive learning paradigm in which a two-dimensional lattice-like structure is imposed on the neurons and those neurons are your cluster prototypes. Now note that in vanilla competitive learning, which we discussed in the previous slide, it does not force the clusters to have relationships with one another. Now, however, in the Conan map, imposing a two-dimensional adjacency on similar cluster, uh, clusters, forcing all the clusters to have these types of adjacent relationships, it is very useful for visualization. And, and so all points assigned to a neuron can be assigned to a 2D cell of a particular shape. So here you, you see that on the left, uh, with the rectangular lattice, all points assigned to that cluster are assigned to a rectangular cell. And here on the right, all points uh, assigned to a cluster are assigned to a hexagonal cell. Uh, and uh, the, the main change that we make uh, <coughs> to, the, to our competitive learning paradigm is that we start off with neurons which have a certain lattice-like pre-arrangement among them. And then when you update these values of WI, you encourage the lattice adjacent neurons to be similar. So this is kind of type of regularization during the learning. So you start off with a pre-arrangement. So you start off with a certain lattice-like structure. So for example, let's say we decide that we have a rectangular lattice. So we start off saying that uh, all our clusters are going to be arranged in a 5 cross 5 grid. So we are going to get 25 clusters and we have these adjacency relationships among the clusters. So, so what it means is that if you have clusters, for example, on the left, if you see WI and WJ, uh, the, the, these clusters WI and WJ will be more similar to one another. The points in them will be more similar to one another than say between WI and WK. Those will be somewhat different from one another. So you can have different types of lattices. So the lattice you decide upfront, whether it's going to be a rectangle, whether it's going to be hexagonal. So I've shown both a rectangular and a hexagonal lattice and depending upon what kind of the lattice you choose up front, uh, in the end, your cluster is going to get mapped to a region of that shape. So, for example, if you choose a rectangular lattice, you'll get a rectangular region. If you choose a hexagonal lattice, you will get a hexagonal region. So, here I've shown uh, the, the types of cluster where you, when you choose a rectangular lattice or when you choose a hexagonal lattice. <coughs> So uh, what is the modification to the basic competitive learning algorithm that we discussed in previous slides? So the main difference is that the weights in the winner neuron are, uh, uh, are, are although they are updated in a similar manner to vanilla competitive learning algorithm, a damped version of the update is also applied to the lattice neighbors of the winner neuron. So, what this means is that, uh, remember that in the original algorithm, you only pick one winner neuron and you update the weights. However, here what you say is that you can, uh, you're not only going to update the winner neuron, you're going to provide uh, similar updates to the neurons near it. Of, of course, the, those updates won't be as large because th those are not the winners, but they are near winners. So by applying a similar update, to the lattice neighbors of the winner neuron, it has the effect of moving similar points to lattice adjacent cluster. This is what is useful for, for visualization. This is what really provides your two-dimensional organization. Uh, 
Now note that when I say lattice neighbors, you can even have a smooth kernel where all neurons are updated and depending on what the lattice distance is, depending on what the lattice distance is, you will move more or less. So for example, if a neuron is very close to another neuron, it's going to move a lot. Uh, to, to the winner neuron that is going to move a lot. On the other hand, if a neuron is very far away from the winner neuron, it's going to move only a little bit. So let's look at a kernel like that. Let's look at, for example, the uh, Gaussian kernel. So in the Gaussian kernel, uh, you have this damping function, damp ij, between two neurons, w, wi and wj, between the weight vectors of two neurons, wi and uh, is the exponentiated value of the distance exp minus l dist ij square divided by 2 sigma square. Now, sigma is your bandwidth which kind of regulates how much regularization you want to use. Now, note that uh, if you use extremely small value of sigma, this reverts to pure winner-take-all learning. So, uh, now note that here your update, uh, you can see the update is different from the update of competitive learning in only a minor way. In competitive learning, you're only updating the winner neuron. Here, you're updating all neurons after applying a damping function. So, uh, for example, here you can see the update is for all i, except that now you have a damping function. Depending on how far the neuron i is from neuron p, the winner neuron. Let's say P is the winner neuron, then depending on how far the neuron I is from neuron P, you're going to update it more or less. So if it's very far away from the neuron neuron, you're going to update it a little bit. If it's close to the winner neuron, you're going to update it more. Now note that a special case of this damping function is that you set damp I P to 1 when I is equal to P and 0 otherwise. That's pure... Uh, competitive learning and in fact if you use extremely small values of sigma it reverts to this special case now uh, one point that I would like to mention so for example let's say that here uh, WJ uh, WI is a winner neuron so let's look at the rectangular gate let's say WI is a winner neuron then what's going to happen is that in pure competitive learning only WI will be updated However, in the covenant map, not only will WI be updated, WJ will be updated a lot because it's, the distance is only one. WK, however, will be updated very little because what's going to happen, the distance to that, you can see it's two uh, in the horizontal di direction and three in the vertical direction. So the overall distance is two square plus three square square root. So it's square root of 13 between WK and WI. So because the eldest, the lat that's the lattice disk is, is high, you are going to move it a lot less. So, so, so what will happen is that with, with these types of updates, the uh, clusters in lattice adjacent regions, they, they will tend to be very similar. So here I have given an illustrative example of the visualization. Note that this is uh, just an illustrative example. It does not re require an actual output of a program where uh, we have four documents belong to four topics and we show, uh, we, we color the clusters depending upon the majority uh, topic of the documents assigned to a particular neuron. So here you can see that all the drama uh, documents, they tend to get clustered in adjacent neurons. All the literature documents, they tend to get uh, clustered in adjacent neurons, the arts, and, and the same is true for the arts and the mu music. And this type of visualization uh, is very useful in practical application. And the reason this happens is because of the different way in which you make the updates with the Kohonan self-organizing map. Because in the Kohonan self-organizing map, while making an update, you not only update the uh, winner neuron, but you also update the adjacent neurons to the winner neuron. So that is why the, ad uh, the adjacent clusters always tend to contain similar topics. Now, in the book, I've also discussed some other uh, applications of competitive learning. In particular, I have discussed vector quantization, which is used for compression.